Welcome back to a brand new episode of the MMA Beat. It is Thursday, August 3rd, 2017. Hello again, everyone. We missed you. Thanks for joining us. Great to be back inside our New York City studio. Great to be back alongside these fine gentlemen as we replay the <laughs> intro right there. That's how excited we are. But we are back. Yes, it's true. This is not a drill. I'm Ariel Hawani. So great to be back. We have been off for, I think, the last two weeks. It has felt like an eternity. That means we have a lot to discuss, so let us get right into it. I think we are live. Yes, there we are. How about that? This is Luke Thomas of SiriusXM and MMAfighting.com. It is good to see you again. That is the man in the hat, Chuck Minenhall of MMAfighting.com and The Ringer. And that is the man in the shirt, Jeff Wagenheim of The Washington Post, who got a little sun, it seems. Oh, yeah. At yeah. least from this vantage yeah, point. Yeah, I'm not here. I'm on the beach. Okay. <laughs> that means you've been on the beach a lot these yeah. days. Um, all right, guys. People have missed us. I have missed you. Let us let us start with UFC 214 and kind of put it to bed. And there are so many angles that we could talk about post-214. It was kind of like a media member's dream because there were just so many stories going into that fight card, coming out of that fight card. So let me just start with this kind of overall picture stuff. Biggest takeaway from 214. You could go in any direction possible, but to you, when I say, all right, what's your biggest takeaway from Saturday night in Anaheim? What comes to mind? I, I'll say this. I don't know if it's my biggest takeaway, but I think it's one that deserves to be uh, repeated a little bit more, get a little more attention. So I'm going to start with this one. Um, it turned out to be way more successful than I thought it would be. Okay. Heading into UFC 214, you knew it was going to do well, and you knew on paper the card was stacked, and you knew that the main event was going to be, it was going to deliver one way or the other, you kind of thought, right? Um, and it was certainly of significance, top pound for pound, for the title, return of John Jones, the story of Daniel Cormier, we all know the deal. And the metrics, and they're anecdotal to an extent, but the metrics leading up were at least imprecise. They were telling you it was gonna be good, but not great. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, from Wednesday, to Thursday, to Friday, to Saturday, felt like we were the frog in the boiling water, and when we got in, it was tepid, but by the time it was Saturday, it was a raging inferno. And afterwards, Dana White's saying it was trending towards a million. That surprised me. It surprised me too. I'm still a little skeptical of it, but here's what I think. This has been a down year, everyone knows that, and I'm not saying this is some kind of turning point, but it's good to see that Jones is back. It does not appear that his star power has waned that much, Perhaps he can set himself up to make it even bigger than it was. And it was just nice that an MMA event absolutely delivered with significance for the casual audience and that we can that, that there are other stars in this company that can do big work when they have to. And I thought it was, uh, you know, it was telling that we were all on eggshells essentially as we were going forward with it. That basically nobody wanted to jinx anything by taking for granted that we were going to get the iteration mm -hmm. of that fight card that was meant to happen. And it's just, it, it's, it goes backwards to all the different, um, all the different shufflings through weight, you know, cuts and everything that we've had falling out in these fight cards. There was a part of me that was like, I hope that we just get this card. But you didn't want to get too excited about it. This is the new way to have to view a card. Like, you don't know what's going to happen to it. I thought by the time we got to Saturday, like you said, I was very, very excited. It's rare that I really get excited over a fight card as a whole. Like, where you're looking and you're like, there are eight or nine fights deep that you can look at and be like, wow, a fascinating fight, fascinating fight. And so for me, when it got to Saturday and I felt like nothing crazy was going to happen, I, I was able to sort of soak it in and be like, wow, this is going to happen. And, you know... And really think about each one of those things individually, especially John Jones and Daniel Cormier, which, like you said, man, I thought it really, you know, Jones coming back and the way he handled himself and, uh, and got that, that victory to close out that rivalry was a big deal for me, too. Yeah, I would agree that with both you guys, the, the winner of the main event of a fight card should be the story. I mean, that, that's no secret. But John Jones, in this instance, um, not only won, but he won in a, a really impressive way. And he handled himself both before the fight card with a more self-assured way, you know, kind of playing a little bit of the villain. But then in the end, after he wins, he was very gracious in the way he way he reacted. And we were talking about this on the on the train ride in here that that you can't manufacture that stuff. You are the adrenaline is pumping through your veins, and and when you um, uh, and when that moment happens and the fight has just ended, you're going to react the way you were meant to react. And he reacted, I thought, in a really positive way in the way he way he went over to uh, to Cormier. Um, but I also think that. Um, you know, this also, there was a lot more going on. Three title fights, and this was another example of how, you know, Dana White is, finds, finds new ways every time to alienate a, one of his champions. There was, and there was trepidation, too, because you've talked about this before. When there are three title fights yeah. on a UFC card, they, they don't always work out. And I thought that this time, particularly these three fights put together, I always thought it would work, and it did, you know? Well, I also just feel like, to, maybe it's worth, again, repeating the point just for one second. I think MMA needed this. 
Like, the sport yeah. needed this. Yeah. This year has not been good. We have not... This is the first fight this year that has been a major headliner for significant yeah. stakes that the casual audience paid attention to, and it all delivered in every way. Yeah. This is the first one. It's it's now August. That was July. Yeah. yeah. So I kind of felt like, man, like we were thirsty for some kind of uh, just opportunity like this. And again, come in event. Okay, it's a bit of a different story, but. Jones has returned the way it did, and if it did a million buys, dude, that's a major, major home run. Yeah, I was actually going to piggyback with that same point. It felt like we were just dying for a star to emerge, and it felt like we were anxious to see John Jones finally return. I think that's part of the trepidation. Yeah. Like We wanted to see him come back, see how he looks, and have a big event feel and have a big name. I think I think we're kind of missing the big stars and the big events because the last one was probably UFC 207 when Ronda Rousey came in and went, and to me... You were there at the open workouts. We were around him. John Jones felt like a superstar, right? Mm -hmm. He handled himself like a superstar. It felt like a big deal. And I think the fans there in, in Orange County or in the neighboring areas really treated him as such. And the, the whole event just felt like a big deal. And I was just kind of reminded how much we missed that. Like 213 just didn't feel like a big deal, especially come fight night when the main event fell through. But John Jones, basically my my takeaway to your takeaway is John Jones still got it. Yep. You know, like the year and a half yep. didn't really affect a, his star power, or the way he handles himself. In fact, maybe this more unfiltered John Jones is an even better John Jones, but he had that presence to him, and the suits at WME couldn't be happier. I yeah. mean, I would imagine they're they're just thrilled that he's back looking like that, yeah. right? And if they hit a million or even came close to that, to, what that says to me is, is not that they hit tons of casuals, but that there's a lot more MMA fans out there than, than maybe we, we anticipated. I mean, we were joking about you know me going down to the beach. I was down hanging out with people who were, don't watch the sport at all, and but they know what I write about, and they and a bunch of them were asking me about the big boxing matches happening later on this month. They're you know they're they're kind of focusing on Dana that. Shows up with a shirt this May with <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're focusing on that, and the, the, you know I was at the I was hanging out with these people like a day or two after after the Jones-Cormier fight. So still, those people who are sports fans and are are not really that, they're, they're not drawn into MMA necessarily, but I do think that if they, can go, if they can claim that number, then they really have expanded the fan base uh, significantly. And I think, you know, we talk, we'll get to this Brock Lesnar thing later, but I think, let's say he sold 800,000, which is less than Dana's, but still, still would be enormously mm -hmm. successful. Number one, he is the kind of guy with that kind of performance at that kind of buy rate who is setting himself up for not just a Brock Lesnar big fight, but some other Smart. kind of big fight on top of that. And I think, too, how many times have we talked about in the show, you know, it's one thing to have the Rouseys and the Connors who do a million buys guaranteed every time, but that we were missing that upper middle class well, welcome back, John Jones. Right. Upper middle they class. They can sell between five to, to, to seven hundred thousand. Yes. It's it's a very welcome, uh, you know, renewal almost. There's a massive gap yeah. between the Rondas and Connors, and then the the DJs and the Cody Garbrandts and yeah. the Tyron Woodleys. John Jones is probably above the middle class. You said upper middle class. I think that's accurate. What was your biggest takeaway? So mine, I mean, when, you, when I look back at it, and I think, you know, I think some people were sort of framing this as this could be a John Jones redemption story or something along those lines. But I always felt like we went through that phase of John Jones's career. This particular time, it, it felt like he, he was at a lived in place. He had been there. He'd done it. He's, there was something like acceptance in his demeanor the whole way. Mm -hmm. He wasn't trying to put on airs. For, for years, I thought he wrestled with, um, you know, sort of a righteousness that was stemmed from his religious upbringing and who he was versus who he really was. And it was it came across phony in the end. And I think a lot of people, there, if there was a big, um, you know, going back to the Rashad Evans and all those, you know, exposing that sort of side of him, we've seen it in so many different ways. But this particular time, it just felt very lived in. He felt like he'd grown into himself a little bit, maybe at 30 years old. Um, there was still some awkwardness, but at the same time, I felt like even the way he handled himself afterwards, like saying he got, you know, he took his cues from Conor McGregor, he's been paying attention, he, you know, mentions Brock Lesnar, sets the table. I mean, all every everything he handled himself in the ring, outside of it, I just felt like he really, uh, he just came across more genuine to me. And to see him actually back it up in, you know, and show that he's been working that hard and was going and put that thing to rest and gave good respect to Dan Cormier. To me, I felt like, maybe I'm being fooled again, but I felt like we're seeing the John Jones that we were hoping to get at some point, you know? Yeah, and it wasn't one narrative. He, he was sort of villainous in the lead up. He was gracious afterward. And this is this is the way people really are. I mean, all of us have had these moments where one, one minute we're acting a certain way and then uh, something happens and we act a different way. This is real and this is something that we hadn't seen. I mean, what ha always has been the criticism of John Jones? 
oh, he's phony. And that's, and I think that's been a legitimate criticism for a lot of the way he's presented himself publicly. Uh, and I don't think he could have that criticism uh, after this after this showing. Even in that post-fight presser, you know, I, I don't remember exact wording, but he's like, yeah, you know, I'm going to do better, but I'm still a wild man. You know, he mm -hmm. kind of points it out. And I'm like, to me, there's nothing wrong with admitting that you're you're that kind of person. It's obviously just now like, hey, man, you got to you got to steer clear of all that stuff to keep your career on course. And the best thing of all, he wouldn't answer his question. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing. Do you want to address that? He he no, was, I talked no. about it in the live chat yesterday. I've, I, I'm, I thought I'm, it was, I'm sick to death of it, to be honest. Actually, if I could just say, I thought sure. that that was his lone misstep. I thought yeah. he was, fu it, it, to I me, agree. just give you a one line answer and move on. But yeah. to make a bigger deal out of that, I, I, I don't think, and of, of course, you know, there's no real reason for this. Right. We know that. Um, you have not been unfair. In fact, I think you've actually been fair to him uh, more so than others. That, to me, was like his lone... P Everything else mm -hmm. I thought was flawless well, except for that one moment. But it wasn't phony. Well, okay, well. but this is this is also the point. Like, he was chippy with media a little bit all week. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And he, uh, I wasn't the only one he didn't want to talk to. So there's something to be said for that. But to Chuck's point... Uh, and look, and guys, are, you know, in the week up to a competition... Do I expect championship caliber fighters to be super friendly all the time? No. As, you know, I mean, yeah. you know, you've interviewed Rampage cutting weight. Yeah. It's a bit of a nightmare. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, okay, so there's a little bit to be said for that too. But I think to Chuck's point is it's one thing to say if you watch what happened in the Daniel Cormier fight, he rose to the occasion, right? I and mean, stopping mm -hmm. the guy, first first person to ever do it, and he looked. I won't say flawless because Daniel also, I think, to his abilities, rose to the occasion. But I also feel like he rose to the occasion at least for now outside of the cage. There were certain real deal parameters put on him and it's like either you're going to do this right. the hard way, the long way, the painful way or this is just not going to go for you. And at least for now in that space after the, after the UFC 200 debacle, it seems to me like from all indications he's been living the right way, training the right way and sort of mentally putting him in a space to propel himself it seems back like to he really took you know going back to the thing with you and whatever else media anybody who and whatever wherever he got his grudges maybe he's packing them into a place that's actually positive for him rather than the reverse um, you know I think he's always he's been a guy who has paid attention to what's said about him this whole career um, but I feel I think that that year off where we just people not us particular but like people began to write him off as just a lost cause and a guy who um, shed his own goat status beat himself and all that you know it probably resonated with him on some level through that whole time because I thought that that was part of what was packed into the new John Jones like you're seeing a guy who was he was going to um, prove haters wrong he talked about that sort of thing and um, it's just it would be interesting to see what he does next man I mean that's that's what's the fun thing about it is he got to the point where we've got to see if he's still got it in the cage, what he's going to do. He closes out brilliantly this Daniel Cormier thing. Now you get to see what he does next. He also <laughs> lost his mom in yes. the, since yeah. the time since he last competed. And, um, you know, you can train all you want. You can do all these things in your training and your, and your fighting and all that stuff. But something like that can be such a uh, kind of an existential crisis for a person, uh, especially a younger person. Um, and, you know, clearly that affected him in a big way. I think he was even asked of him during one of the press conferences. And, um, you know, these, this is something that can help settle a person and, and turn them into an adult because, you know, that, that's a well, crisis. The big, the big question we always used to get was, when is John Jones going to get it together? Mm. When is he mm. going to figure it out? And the answer was always, whenever he's ready. <laughs> you know, and it looks like you at least are beginning to see some of that where he is now ready to put himself in a position to maximize his potential. Will he ultimately do it? The story's not over. We'll see how it goes. But at least for this chapter, is a pretty, pretty strong one for and, him. And the one moment that could have felt the fakest, the least authentic, was the moment afterwards with Daniel Cormier, you know, because we saw him do the DX thing, we saw him say, I hope you're crying. But honestly... You're, not, that you're the king of strike force, not the king of the grind, remember that? <laughs> that, that was my favorite moment, when, when he said that, you know, Daniel is a role model, I want to yeah. be a husband like him, I want to be a person like him, and for him to go there, like, he did not go low at all. In fact, he went high, and, and, and then I think that that allowed people, the, the, the compassion and the respect that Cormier has received in a loss is way oh, yeah. more than after every we win. We talk about and this all the time, how a guy can lose sometimes yeah. and they become a bigger star in the aftermath because you see some human side, you know, more so than you've seen before. I think people, I mean, yes, there were a few that tried to stick it yeah. to him and make these stupid memes, but I think Jones's reaction to Cormier afterwards let the world know, including his fans, it's okay to respect this guy. It's okay to treat him as a former champion. We didn't he know wasn't if a paper that. champion. Yes, I we, know. We, we were, That's what I, I loved know, about You mentioned it. and I wrote about this too. I was like, they might take this this thing to the grave, yeah. where they just no. will never bury the hatchet and they'll just go this way. It, I, honestly, their rivalry has been so bitter and so public 
and so personal in public at the same time that you're like, you'd, I wasn't sure they'd ever get over that. But for the most part, it looked like John Jones was trying to, to not make that. It felt case. very real. Yeah. It felt like he truly believed what he was saying about DC and cared for him. In fact, I'll even say like members of his team have contacted me to ask me how DC is doing. Do you know, have you talked to him? Like they, they care. Now I think when they're 70 and 80 at like, you know, autograph signings like Ali and Frazier were, I believe they'll be crapping on each other and insulting each other. They're just never gonna be friends. But in that moment, up 2-0, for now, the rivalry is over. And by the way, I disagree with DC. There was a rivalry. It was a thing. Just because he ended up sweeping him, it doesn't mean that there wasn't a rivalry. I think it was nice for John to set that tone and let the world know that you can respect this guy. And he was a real champion, and he deserves your respect. Because I do think he's one of the greatest of all time, regardless of weight class. Your biggest takeaway? Well, really, the, the, the John Jones stuff was A number one for me. But since we've already talked about that, I mean, I, I guess the next thing I would come down to is, well, two things. One is was how... Cormier was treated after the after the knockout. I really uh -huh. feel as though um, that overhead shot. I'm sure people out there have all seen it, and it's just heartbreaking. You know, he's he's stumbling around the cage, and people are people who he doesn't know are corralling him. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that commissions have to learn that either medical personnel have to be in there, or at at the very least, his his team, his his uh, his cornerman, or somebody should be able to come in and see a concussed fighter who. In his in his mind is somebody that he can trust that he can he knows is there for him. I mean that was I thought that was a really heartbreaking moment at the end of the the, the fight. Can I ask you a follow up just before you get to your second point? I was on a radio show yesterday and they were I felt trying to get me to <laughs> disparage Dana White in the UFC because of that moment. And I didn't even think of it this way. They were like they they mishandled it. They were keeping him in the cage. They right. weren't letting him. And I was like, wait a second. They, they can't just let a concussed fighter walk out of the cage. Right. I think that they were doing it, A, for his health, and B, for public perception, because guys like Forrest Griffin have been criticized when they just stormed out of yeah. the cage before the judge's but decision. But wasn't Ronda Rousey Ronda allowed Rousey. to leave after she got brutalized? I don't know. I, was she? I don't, I don't, I don't she remember her special handling in that case. I, I, I remember <laughs> the sh there is a shot of Ronda and Holly Holm standing next to each other no, when no, no, with, uh, against Amanda Nunes. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I, I, I honestly, she both, I'm pretty okay, sure. But so I thought she did. Yeah, is the UFC saw, at fault? I thought that they were actually I, taking I, care of Daniel. First, I don't think it's moment. UFC anyway. I think it's the commission. Well, there was a moment where Dana was there. Dana White walked over, but you saw that Dana White was kind of like reaching between a couple of commission guys just to talk to him, and not he he clearly wasn't going past those guys because I think there was some kind of perimeter of, of commission guys that, that that are around him. And I don't know what the protocol for that is, but clearly Dana White knew the protocol was that he wasn't allowed to, to go past those guys, but he was trying his best to talk to them. I mean, I thought that Dana White in that case did the right thing, to at least try to calm him down. Yeah. If you saw the way Cormier was stumbling around, if he was allowed to walk out of the cage, he was going to go down those steps face first. Yeah. I mean, so I think it was the would have been irresponsible to just let him, oh, yeah, sure, go ahead. Sure. I think they needed to have someone come in and, and help him. Somebody to, whether it be, again, somebody from his corner or somebody who's some medical personnel to just say, you know, to try, to, try to deal with him. Really both. I mean, I think you need somebody who that guy can trust because he, you know, his, his mind is, is elsewhere he needs somebody who he might see as familiar, not just like some random, you know, guys with, with commission jackets on. Okay. And what was your second point? Well, really, it was it was the, the co-main event and, and all the the furor that in the wake of uh, the wake of the Woodley performance, which um, you know I, I understand why paying customers uh, don't want to watch a guy who lands what the fewest uh, strikes, but you know you're fi you're fighting a guy who's the best jujitsu guy out there. So you basically have now, be, it's you're not going to the mat with the guy. So now you, all you can do is throw strikes. And it turned out that Woodley ha has enough of a shoulder injury that he couldn't even throw his overhand right hand. Now I know people didn't know that at the time, yeah. but but for Dana White to go out afterward and just completely throw this guy under the bus, and it's not the first champion, it's probably about the fifth champion that he's thrown over the, under the bus in the last few months, I, I thought was just really, uh, uh, I mean, I felt like it was Dana White trying to, you know, look good in front of the fans, because so that he could then privately go to to uh, to uh, Woodley later on and apologize, or at least bury the hatchet, as they say, just like he did with with uh, Demetrius Johnson. But publicly, he goes after these champions, and I just feel like it's uh, just a bad look. Also weird that you know they they positioned Woodley into a, a, a spot where he was <laughs> not dictating control over the welterweight division but of the middleweight division which was a very strange sort of thing and this gsp sweepstakes yeah it's like it swings over here because you didn't perform i don't know that that whole thing um 
It's just, uh, you know, you could say this about many, many Dana White exits out of a out of a out of a fight card that he takes some kind of tack that he thinks a little strong. But to me, I, I you know, I was very critical, I think, of, uh, of of Woodley as I'm watching it because I'm watching. I don't know about his shoulder. Sure. I've since, and I actually wrote a column about this too, basically saying, you know, you're watching a guy who is coming off a pretty criticized performance in the second Wonder Boy fight. And he comes in here, and what you're seeing him is shut down. His game plan seemed at the time, as you're watching on live TV, perfectly executed in shutting down somebody else's offense. But that seemed to be the whole story, right. you know, as it was playing out. And, um, you know, you learn, you, you later learn about his shoulder and everything. You think, okay, this just ratcheted up like times 10 of how, how good of a performance that was. And, I, you know, I feel a little bad myself for actually writing that piece without knowing the full, um, the full facts. But in my mind, you know, it, going back to the whole thing, I still, doesn't it just seem like, I, I don't know how long Woodley's going to be out. I guess that's really the question. Did they say? He doesn't know yet. Okay. Because he's trying to see if he can avoid surgery. Okay. It could be a significant amount of time. Yeah, and if it's significant, then I guess the, the Bisping, <clears throat> at that point, the Bisping GSP, you're almost like, just let them play it out. Sure, but, sure. Um, in reverse, like going back to it, I just, I would have rather have seen knowing that the GSP Woodley fight is all okay, that. So, okay, can we just address, like, was that really that bad of a fight? Look, here's my view on this. Um, it was not entertaining. It was not entertaining. Right. I, I don't know how you could watch that and be like, wow, that was just, so, I, I mean, edge of my seat. Uh -huh. uh, maybe the first couple of rounds, even the, th the third round. Uh, but the most takedowns <clears throat> were in the first and then the fifth round. Mm -hmm. uh, I think six and seven, something like that. Attempts. Attempts, yeah. yeah. Um, and so that, it was really the bookends that were the best parts of that. But it, it, look, it's one thing to say it's not entertaining. It's another thing to say, I'm so not entertained, I'm going to hur hurl abuse at you. Mm -hmm. I think that's where I draw the line. I think right. when these fighters come on and say, you don't understand, you don't understand the intricacies, well, dude, who are you selling tickets to? Coaches of the universe? Exactly right. You're selling exactly tickets right. to the average person. So if, the, you're, if, you're, if that's what you're welcoming as a customer, then you have to kind of expect that there's just going to be a certain mm -hmm. expectation of that. And I don't, I'm not defending the fans for booing. I think that's where I draw the line. But I do think it is perfectly acceptable to say it was not entertaining. Uh, on the other hand, I think the, for me to piggyback on the on the on the thing is it, it was interesting was heading into this camp or sorry this fight, I was beginning to detect the fans were actually coming around to Woodley. They were cheering for him at that press conference. Um, he obviously looks like a tremendous beast. Uh, he does it on his uh, champ camp thing. You can look at all the, the responses to it. People love it. And people were saying, you know, this guy came into the uh, welterweight title picture saying, I'm not going to fight anyone. I'm going to fight, you know, uh, money fights. And then he fights Wonder Boy twice and then Demi and Maya. Like the toughest contenders all the way down. And it just seems like he's got this perpetually uneasy relationship with the fan base where he is deserving of a lot of credit. But because he has this, like, uh, uh, not an inability, but because of the circumstances, they just seem to clash all yeah. the time. And shut down Wonder So everybody thought that was going to be fireworks either time, right? Like, and uh, he shut down Wonder First Boy one was Fight of the Night of on a pretty stacked card. And it's card. really weird because the if you watch them, right. yeah, if you watch those, like, they're, they're not so extremely different, the no. first and second Wonder Boy fights. It's just I think people expected them to sell out more or something. And I think that that's where it came down to. People don't sense that he's selling out enough or he's not putting himself in a position which, of course, some guys are not going to do. They're, going, they're not going to do that. They're not going to get in a gunfight when they don't have to. Sure. Um, but, you know, the whole thing, I think I, I side with Woodley, which is a weird, it's a weird sort of thing and, and on whole. Because if, you, if you're hurt and you make it through five rounds and you shut down a guy like that, it doesn't matter that you neutralized another guy. It, it matters that you escaped knowing that you did that. So sure. you got to side with him knowing that he was hurt through that whole thing. Here is what I think is a fundamental problem in our sport. There's such a fall from being champion to just being a mid-tier guy. This is Stipe Miocic's <clears throat> problem right now. Like yeah. the, Luke Rockhold faces problem. Chris Weidman faces problem. Once you lose that belt, your pay goes way down. Mm -hmm. I know. So now you're breeding, like, that's why I sided with Amanda Nunes. Luke Rockhold is fighting in Pittsburgh <laughs> on the same day as yeah. Triple G Canelo. Canelo, for right. much less money than yeah. he was making as champion. Yep. And so that's why I sided with Amanda Nunes. If you yeah. are not feeling up to it, why should you go out there, risk your title, and then go all the way back down to making 50 and 50, 80 and 80, whatever the case may be? And so Tyron Woodley is champion. Now, I'm not suggesting that he is taking the safe route. I'm suggesting that he's doing what he needs to win. Right. Fans be damned, because he gets yeah. to keep that belt and continue to make money. Now, I don't believe for a second that he lost the GSP fight um, as a result of that fight, I believe the GSP fight, as I've been saying for quite some time, was always <laughs> going to be the best. So funny Wait, how that it, I thought the ship had already sailed. No, <laughs> the ship did not sail. Oh. He even said oh, at the press conference, Dana White, that he was meeting with GSP's people later on that day. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I don't believe that. 
But you could make the case that, okay, maybe they won't be eager to put him in, you know, bigger cards, bigger spots, pay-per-view money. Like, there is something going on here. I, I just don't think that it's fair knowing that this man is going to lose all this money. And I get why the fans are upset. They don't care about this stuff. They're paying $100 to watch this live. They just want to see action. But you have to understand the intricacies of this business. Yeah. And Tyron Woodley is just being a smart businessman. He's winning dominantly, five rounds to none in my opinion, and he's getting to keep his belt. Rules That's create, a good day at the office. It's just, oh, go ahead. So rules create incentives. Number one, though, and not just the rules of what happens in the Oxagon, but the rules of how you get paid. That this will all dictate behavior. Uh, and also, he's been the most active champion in the last year. He has. Right? And fans said, we want you to fight number one contenders. Right. And he That's did. That's exactly what he <laughs> right. did. Right. Right. Sports I mean, how are, mad can you get yeah. at him? Sports are about winning and losing, ultimately, right? Every sport. Now, I realize that this is a sport that's a little more personality driven. You have to uh, also entertain. You know, I've watched many a, a football game where it's a defensive struggle, not exactly the most beautiful uh, beautiful performance by the offenses, but the defenses are, are slugging it out, and it's an, it's an engrossing game. You could, you could argue that if you were into uh, you know, takedown defense, that, that this was a pretty masterful thing. I mean, you're, so you, for, for takedown defense, it's one of the best performances yeah. in UFC history. Okay, yeah, so, true. so true. even within that narrow confines, to say that you turned in one of the best, well, really, 24 for 24, it doesn't get much better than that. You, know you can do that. You know what it seems like to me? Remember when the Knicks and Heat would score games like 76 yeah, yeah, yeah. to 74, and that was your final score? That's kind of what it's like. You but, know, you're watching a product, you're like, I understand what's happening, but the action is slowed like, down. The other part is like, fans are always going to love a gunfight. Sure. It's how yeah. it's always going 100%. to be. I mean, it's uh, trying to explain to them, you don't understand. That's true. Maybe they don't. Maybe they actually don't understand. But they're not going to, and they never have, and they never will. This is, you know, some, some might. I mean, I'm not... You know what I mean? Like, yeah. they could go and train. But, like, generally speaking, the average fan, yeah. they have a certain level of understanding and a certain level of, of appreciation, and the rest of it needs to be entertained. The other it's, thing a, is, it's a spectator sport. The other thing is, when GSP comes back, you know, we, we used to herald GSP yeah. for right. his dominance in the cage. A little bit but boring. I know. <laughs> when you really look back at his last bunch of fights, or, you he know, was getting and who, on this, who on this yeah. panel was covering MMA in, in January of 2009? Anybody? Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah? Okay, well, that was the last time GSP finished a fight. Uh-huh. Right? That was what the pen fight. That was that was the the pen fight. Yeah, wow. that's the Turning last time he's had. But, but the difference between Penn and Woodley, for example, is you go look at GSP's fights. He smashed Jay Huron, smashed, and he didn't finish, but like beat up Carl Parisian, and then was it? Uh, I mean, was it Dave Strasser? I can't remember. All the he put in work where he got a reputation. How about the beating he gave Frank Trigg, or uh -huh. the busting up the face of Sean Shirk? He has all these fights where he was crushing yeah. fools. And the things he did to Mayhem Miller. Yeah. Uh, Woodley has obviously a good reputation, but not quite the same He's scrolling. crushing fools too. Jay Heron. He was, but, Josh he, had, but he had a couple of missteps along the way. Right. And I think he never quite reached a celebrity status at the same time. Uh, GSP, remember, after the Trigg fight, I mean, he, he beat Trigg in a way no one beat Trigg. Mm. And then he gets down on his knees and says, please, yeah, give yeah. me the title shot. It was these huge, like, this, 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 you know, exponential rise to the stars, Woodley's has been a little bit more staggered, and so I don't think he has the benefit of celebrity when he has well, events like this. What's wrong with this scenario playing out? Tyron Woodley's promoter, Dana White, who he's had this on and off relationship with, although it seemed like they were turning the corner to the point that Woodley was invited to Dana White's son's birthday party, the only fighter on the roster, which is just kind of bizarre, but anyway. Was it to see Kendrick Lamar? It was. Yeah. So, so, show up to the post-fight press conference, as you said, look, that wasn't the most entertaining fight of all time. That's not going to make anyone's highlight reel. But if you look at that card, four out of the five fights on the main card were pretty darn entertaining. Mm -hmm. You had something for everyone. You had the dominance of Chris Cyborg. You had the back and forth of Jones Cormier. You had the firefight that was uh, Cerrone Lawler. You had the shocking knockout that was Volkan Uzdemir. You got everything, not to mention Brian Ortega and Aljamain Sterling, blah, blah, blah. And so they can't all be barn burners. But... We believe as a promotion that if you paid $60 on pay-per-view or $200 to watch this live, that you got your money's worth tonight. And oh, by the way, you got to see a dominant performance by a reigning champion. As opposed to, you know, that was garbage, that was not entertaining, you're losing your GSP fight. Like, there's a way to kind of promoter spin. And I just don't understand this mentality of completely devaluing a guy. And then, like we saw with John Jones, letting people know that it's okay to cheer Daniel Cormier and give him his due props, now you're telling the world it's okay to flood Tyron Woodley and, and label him as a boring champion who takes no risk. I'm going to defend Dana because, as a buddy of mine once said, he, the guy, he just dumps everybody in the grease. He really <laughs> does, man. He's like, let's put you guys on high on fry. Um, I think where I draw the line with Dana is when he says, who would want to pay money to see Tyron Woodley? 
That to me was like, like a real red flag. That you're setting this guy up for failure, basically. And that only hurts you as a company. It does. So it's, it's so it's cut off your nose to spite your face. But here's the thing: when Bob Arum goes out there after one of his fighters puts on a stinker, he defends him, uh, and everyone calls him inauthentic for it. Now that's not the only reason they call him inauthentic, but certainly that contributes to it. Dana White goes out there, and I, I, I again, I, I think he went way too far. But that's the thing: you don't have to say that was the greatest uh, performance of all time. Okay. But there's a way. Okay, he can find a middle right. ground. But I'm just saying because the card was is, stacked. Dana White's lost some of that relationship with the fans, but when he had it at its most, they felt like he spoke for them. So saying who wants to pay money to see it was definitely overboard. I'm not saying it wasn't, but I understand him being at least somewhat critical of it. If this was the main event, and that was a stinker of a card, and this capped it, then yeah, it's justified. But it wasn't. And so you have to view it as a, a, a sum of a big part. Yeah, he you know could have made I mean? a subtler jab. I mean, he could have just been like, yeah, oh, no, 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 no doubt, thing, yeah. no doubt. Yeah. I, I, mean, I, I just don't understand. And, and by the way, Dana White did a scrum on Friday after the weigh-ins. It's on camera. And he was like, yeah, I don't think the fans are going to like this fight. Like, he was predicting it. Really? Which was a bizarre way to that. sell the fight going into it. But it's not like this should come as any Weird. surprise. I didn't even see that. Freezing cold takes, whatever that Twitter. Um, yeah. So apparently in 2015, I tweeted, <laughs> Tyron Woodley, how, how much fun or how interesting would Tyron Woodley versus Damian Maya be? This was really? after Maya annihilated Gunnar Nelson, completely dominated uh, him. Right, yeah. And by the way, I stand by it. I think it was interesting. I think it's interesting to see it a guy completely shut down. And if we're going to rip on Tyron Woodley and criticize him, then shouldn't Maya deserve a little bit of the blame? He 100%. did not evolve. He did not adapt. He did not change the game plan. I don't think either of them deserve blame. It was a fight. He tried. Maya only had a month to prepare. You know, so like, I, I, just, I just wish it, it would have just been a thing but it shouldn't have turned into the thing that it turned into. Now, let me ask you about the aftermath. But hold on, did, 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 did Maya speak to the media? Because I was upstairs. He did, yeah, he yes. did. I mean, I'm not sure what he, he said. He offered no excuses. Yeah. Like, he didn't he didn't make excuses for himself. He took yeah. the loss as he is, you know, we expect him to, part, right? Part as of it is that, part of it, and I'm not blaming in any way Tyron for doing it. I'm not saying it's the wrong approach. But if you are defensive, and to an extent, you know, he stands up for himself when he feels like he's being, um, in his, I think, judgment, unfairly criticized. He pushes back, and I think that pushback is what sure. causes the more general uproar. And, and by the way, I'll, I'll stand by this. When this fight was announced, we came on this show, and I was like, eh, something seems off here. Like, you're giving a guy a title shot on a month's it's notice. Super short and it's not, um, and, and it's not like an injury replacement. It's just a title fight being added to a card that already has two titles. And, 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 and I thought that that was off, and I thought it was unfair, and people said, stop crying. You've been asking for him to get a title shot. Be happy with it essentially, and then he brought up a great point. For his seven straight wins, Damian Maya went to Hoboken, New Jersey to train with the Edge wrestling team over there, and look what he turned into. And he couldn't do that this time. Yeah. And so it's very fair to, to think that the reason for his subpar takedowns... So you're saying rematch. Well, I don't know. <laughs> but, but let me ask you about the aftermath. So Tyron Woodley comes on the MMA Hour, and he's like, look, I'm pissed off. I have an injured shoulder. I want an, an apology, and if not, I'm leaking stuff. Oh, man. Was that, was that too far? I mean, he didn't Man. end up leaking anything, and it seems like they've sort of buried the hatchet, although he has know, not received an because apology. Because we keep, we keep extending how, too far, how far too far is, I feel like, especially on your Monday show, you get a lot of this stuff. But um, it, was, it was interesting, and I, I felt like it certainly kind of went uh, almost viral within the MMA community of people like <laughs> talking about this sort of thing. So in some ways, and I saw one editor um, basically saying, like, hey, I wish more guys would go after Dana White because we're getting the biggest page views we've ever had, stuff oh, like that. Okay. <laughs> In some ways, I'm like, you know... You Someone said that? Yeah, yeah, well, so, yeah. That's funny. Okay. Um, but so, I mean, you know, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of going a little far, but at the same time, I feel like these guys, you know, especially him, he has never, he's, he's, like you said, he pushes back. And I feel like he's going to, like, what can, he's going to formulate in his mind, like, what could I do that's really going to make them more vulnerable? And apparently it worked for him. I mean, it didn't take very long for them to kind of get on the same page. So, sure. But privately, that's the thing yeah. that, that kind of gets me, is we, we hear about, about uh, Dana White and Woodley having a private conversation where they bury the hatchet or they kind of, you know, Spent they, the they work the it out. Did you do Demetrius Johnson? You got Demetrius too? Johnson yeah. privately. <laughs> but then publicly, all he does is go out and, and really, you know, chop down these guys, especially his champions. And I think that that's one of the, one of the takeaways is that the fighters – Particularly the fighters at the top of the game are recognizing that that um, you know they don't have to play ball with the they have to fight for the UFC but they don't have to be kind of partners in the sense of of being on the same page. I mean, John Jones talked about it preceding this fight. Now in the aftermath, it, it was a little different, but 
preceding the fight, he was talking also about how he recognizes that this is not a guy who has his back. Of course, you know, John's done enough things that, that it would be hard for any, even a reasonable person, let alone uh, Dana White, to have his back. But still, he's a guy that, that feels like Dana White didn't. Amanda Nunes, Demetrius Johnson, Tyron Woodley. I mean, the list can continue, and the list will continue to grow you know, as time goes on. I don't think extorting apologies is a great way to get apologies. <laughs> you know, either they're, either they're sorry or they're not, right. you know? Um, so I disagreed with that. I didn't think that was necessarily... Is he owed an apology? Yeah, I do think Danny White went over. When you're like, who wants to pay money to see this guy, I thought that was really <clears throat> just below the belt, to be honest. Uh, and it, it not, not only not smart, just a, just a shitty thing to say. Um, but here's the truth, man. Like, this is the part about this fight. Like, there are criticisms to be made in this fight and, and maybe in some other ones that Tyron has had. But I think he's a very proud guy, and he deserves to be a proud guy. And he's a decorated champion, and I think he feels like, who do I have to beat before you guys come around on me a little bit? You know, beating Dong Hyun Kim, beating, obviously, Wonder Boy, uh, not, not twice, but sort of, uh, <laughs> Demi and Maya. I mean, the list goes on and on about guys he has wrecked. Robbie yeah. Lawler. Robbie Lawler, yeah. Carlos Condit. How many former champions has this guy just murked? And people are still like, you know, not only do you need to beat all of these monsters, this the, <laughs> you have to beat the X-Men, and you have to do it in a way that's super entertaining to us. It's like, he's like, what do I have to and do? And before he was at the top, those guys were chipping away at each other's lives. I mean, they were just going in there having wars, you know? Yeah. So yes. for him to have a sense of self-preservation, it only Especially. sort of makes sense after the, the things that were going on with Johnny Hendricks, and look where he's at now, and uh, Robbie Lawler, who, did, he looked like he was okay. I was a little concerned, though, how he'd look in this last fight. Yeah. And uh, you know, Rory McDonald going through these. I mean, all those guys that were in the in the in the heat of that moment and seeing what they did to each other. He's just taking a different tack. I mean. It's it's both true that there are some criticisms that are valid of the fight, and it's also true that he's underappreciated. When I was at the LA stop of the Mayweather McGregor World Tour, someone asked um, Floyd Mayweather while he was doing his scrums, "Who are some MMA fighters that you like that you admire?" He only named one. Tyron Woodley. Mm. And so I was thinking afterwards, what's the difference between Mayweather and Tyron Woodley as fighters? I'm not talking about as, as human beings. We know the difference there. And so what's, like, Floyd's touting the fact that he's going to make maybe 300 million for this fight. Who knows if that's true, but he's probably gonna make in the vicinity of 100, if not way more. Mm -hmm. He's not a very exciting fighter. Why can he make all this money, sell all these pay-per-views, sell all these tickets, and, and, and Tyron can't? Why? Why is that? So in other words, like, Floyd gets credit for being this businessman who you business know is man going who to doesn't get hit, who's the greatest defensive fighter. Yeah. What, 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 like, what is what is Tyron doing? But Floyd is reviled. That's yeah. the difference. So people are paying all this money just to they want to see they wanted to see Pacquiao yeah, knock his yeah. head off. They want to see Maidana knock his head off. And you don't think off. that is it possible? Woodley's reaching that territory. I don't know. Okay, let me let me offer the this. The undefeated record is, though goes someplace too with that. But that would have been the good. That's, it, that would have been the reason to book him against GSP. GSP, the beloved sure. former champion, bring him back. He's going to reclaim the, you know, the the welterweight championship for the people. You know, he's going to he's going to get rid of Woodley. That would have been the fight, in my mind. Bring him back. Sure. Is the difference though, the narrative that is put out afterwards? Who would want to pay to see this guy, as opposed to Leonard Ellerby going up there being. <laughs> This guy's the greatest of all time. You yeah. you just saw you know a, a masterpiece. You saw Mozart at work. You know what I mean? Like yeah, he's got a surrogate. Mm -hmm. Fans take cues. Say anything with authority and half the fans are take cues. It, you know? Also, I mean, look, don't get me wrong. Boxing fans want exciting fights too, but I do think compared to MMA fans, and this is a bit of a generalization, but I think there's something to it. Um, look, everyone likes a Ward Gotti. Sure, uh, of course. No, no one will turn that down. <laughs> but there, I think, is a little bit more tolerance for or I should say, there's, there is not quite the same ravenous appetite for, look, MMA built itself on, you know, whatever you, however exciting you think boxing is, we're even more exciting. Yeah. However, you know, oh, mm -hmm. how crazy it is, we're even crazier. And so I think that fairly inculcated this idea within fans' brains that you should expect wildness at all times. That's Whereas right. boxing fans are a little bit more attuned to chess yeah. and setups and things like right. that. Yeah, before Floyd came along, Pernell Whitaker was a popular guy. He was not hated like Floyd is hated. So Floyd sort of took that defensive mindset and turned and sort of enhanced it with his, you know, his ability to be reviled. And that's a, that's an important thing. And also, just to be clear, boxing fans hate Floyd too. I mean, let's... <laughs> no, I know, but they certainly pay a lot of money. He's to certainly watch the fight. guy, though, that you love him or hate him, that he makes you care. Right. Yeah. So yeah. that's really. I remember they, I some MMA guys who understand that do a lot better than that model. Uh, for for better or worse, 
And I don't necessarily agree with the idea of, as you said, you know, extorting an apology out of someone. That's not something that I would recommend anyone do to their <laughs> yeah. boss. Or, Gun to your forehead, yeah, apologize. Yeah. Sure, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm yes. Couldn't be sorry. For better or worse, I received a lot of tweets afterwards saying, like, that's the first time I've actually liked Tyron Woodley after that interview. Like, I, yeah. I felt his yeah. pain. So I don't know if it worked. We'll see the next time he fights. You were going to say that you were going to talk about what he was going to leak. What was it? Like a... uh, I, did not, I did not say that I would I think he just wants someone to have his back. Yeah. And I, I think he's no. entitled to it. Yeah. Remember when you guys were at MSG when he did yeah. the open workout? He did that chant, who's got my back? Yeah. He has felt, I think, yeah. on an island. And the crowd at the time said, well, Wonder Boy's got your sure. back. It was a bit of a Paul Buentella <laughs> moment. Right. Yeah. But um, let me just go back quickly to Daniel Cormier as we put this to bed. What do you think his legacy will be at this point? Because it is going to be hard to get a third crack at John Jones. Perhaps he goes up the heavyweight if Kane is unavailable and makes a run there. And I certainly think he can make a run mm -hmm. as a heavyweight contender. He did it before, although it was a few years ago. No secret, I think very highly of him as a fighter. I think highly of him as a person. But I do believe he is one of the most underrated champions in UFC history. And I get why. I'm not, I'm not foolish because people believe he was gifted this belt, that he was sort of the Houston Rockets of the 90s, right? <laughs> Jordan takes a break, he gets the championship, and then when Jordan comes back, you know, um, you know, normalcy resumes, and that's the case here. Do you think that this will sort of plague him? You know, the, the second place guy forever who was able to capitalize on a situation, dating even back to his wrestling days with Kale Sanderson and the Olympic, you know, disaster with the weight cutting. Is that who Daniel Cormier is? I don't, I don't want to believe that because I think he's much more than that. But do you think when it's all said and done, that's how people will remember him? I, I, yeah. Yeah. You know, I hate to say that, too, because um, you have such respect for such a high character individual, you know. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. Um, it's, it's a sad correlation, but it's the real one. I've often talked about this. Like, what did we talk about with John before? Like, you know, he had all this, not now, not this chapter, but the previous mm -hmm. chapter, which was he had all this success in spite of himself, right? You know, and partying and not training like he should have, and yet he still went out there and did it. And that's just kind of effortless, you know, because he was so talented. But there's this correlation between guys where the ones who absolutely get in there and wring the sponge of their talent dry, they get every drip out of that, the ones who really do it, they're the ones who typically have to do it because they don't have, I mean, he has obviously a ton of natural ability, but relative to John, there's a, there's a gap. And, you know, on the one hand, I, 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 I cannot say how much I admire somebody who can do that, who can really say, I'm gonna lay it on the line and every part of my life will be devoted to this. No stone will be left unturned, and then they still fail. You know, that's, that's a hard thing to do, but I, I have incredible respect, but if you're talking about their record, it's a tremendous record. It's a tremendous record that's not the highest level of the records, and mm. that will be noted. It doesn't help that he's so brutally honest with himself mm -hmm. that he actually talks about how brutally honest he is himself. He would be the first to probably start this conversation you're talking about. He wouldn't know where his legacy is at this point. Um, I think ultimately it is like what you're saying. Uh, you know, how you, how you remember this guy, and it's weird because if you really pay attention, he's he's overcome a lot just outside of the ring and inside of it. But when you think about even his career, you know, kind of coming in as an alternate um, in that Strike Force Grand Prix, sneaking his way in and then just winning that thing, and he's been just off to the races since that time. The only guy who's really done anything to him um, is John Jones. Yeah. And it, but unfortunately, that's, I think that that's really what's going to come down to is you had, you had John Jones Zera at this point, and Daniel Cormier right now is the guy who gave him the most, you know, out, you know, whatever in the talk and in the ring and everything, but in the cage, but it's he didn't overcome him. So I think that he was just, it's always going to be like that. It's just yeah. John Jones' era. And unfortunately, I mean, I'm a big fan of his too. I just think that he's a, he's been a, he's been very good for the sport. He's been very articulate with the sport. I feel like some of his ability to explain the sport has really rubbed off not just on fans, but some of the other commentators out there who understand. Like you know, I feel like he's made guys like Dominic Cruz better what they do. You know what I mean? He's right. he's that guy. He's going to do that. But as far as his legacy in terms of what people will remember, unfortunately, I think it's going to be the John Jones era. Yeah, when you when you are uh, when there is a giant in in the midst, and that's what John Jones is. The next guy, the next best guy, is always going to seem diminished. And then when John Jones was not in the picture, and Daniel Cormier was at the top of the game, of course he was always viewed as, you know, sort of the the champion with a small C. You know, I, I mean, I, I can't think of a. I'm sure there are some other MMA guys that that would be that would fall into the same category. I can't think of one off the top of my head right now. But I remember um, a long, long time ago when when Larry Holmes. Was the heavyweight champion in boxing, and he, you know, people still remembered Ali. Ali was no longer 
the guy, and Larry Holmes was the guy. And even when Larry Holmes yeah. fought Ali, it was kind of a, a shadow of Ali. But Al, but Larry Holmes was a really good boxer, but he never quite got the same the due that he was de that he deserved because he was not Muhammad Ali. And I think that um, you know if. if Let's say John Jones didn't come back. Let's say that he went away and that was the end of him and, and Cormier kept going along, winning and winning, and, and eventually he might have erased that, uh, that, that stigma. He might have beaten enough guys where they, people would have recognized yeah. him as for the great fighter he is, but when Jones comes back, man, that was I don't know if it. people really look at, the, at this way anymore, but we were, talk, we were kind of talking up this, like, you know, Frazier, Ali angle. And then you look back at those and you said Foreman and stuff. So let's just say that Gustafson <clears throat> and Jones fight next. Mm -hmm. Gustafson wins. Mm. What does this do to Ben Cormier at that point? Mm. We've had a war with, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. it, there, there still could be some shuffling in the perception of this whole thing, just depending on how things play out. We don't know what, you, I'm guessing Cormier, I don't know how much he has, how much motivation he'll have to keep fighting, what he'll do, but um, if he, also he can write a different ending to his story too. So um, I feel like we it'll still be there, but right now, if you're just looking at it in the most realistic sense, I think that that it, it, he he won't be remembered for what we where he was right here. When we're talking about all-time greats, obviously, you know, unless something crazy happens, John will be ahead of Daniel. Sure, like, this is just how it will be. Yeah. But I will say this: I think I've no, uh, I follow on Facebook like a bunch of different um, coaches, uh -huh. and not even famous ones, just guys who own schools in my neighboring area or in other places. And they all posted this one meme of Daniel crying, oh. but not the one they were mocking him. Oh. And it says, "This is the face of a guy," and I'm paraphrasing here, "who um, who gave everything, who tried his hardest, and still came up short. And if you don't care as much as he did about this effort," then you'll never achieve anything. And I will say this, I think in the end, not that John as a competitor is not an incredible role model, I mean, who doesn't want to fight like that? But I actually think as like at wrestling camps, I mean, think, think about it, John never teaches classes. Cormier still teaches kids wrestling yeah. at AKA. As a teaching tool, Cormier is almost a better way to teach because it's like you have to have the bravery to try. Yeah. You have to have the courage to get out there and work, and it may not go for you, but you you must be committed to this in the way that this guy was committed to this, to the point where he was bawling on national yeah. television or international television in a way that is you know a little bit obviously unseemly. And so I actually think in the end, what it will, you know, John will have a better legacy to historians. But I wonder if the 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 model of Daniel Cormier is something you can share more with youth at scale. I think history will actually be kind to him. In a weird way, if John never came back and he <clears> remained <throat> champion for many years, people will always call him a paper champion, but I think it was great for him and his legacy that John gave him that respect. And I think that for some weird reason, because of that moment, that very raw moment on national television, that people now in some way are emotionally attached to him. They, I, I mean, I got so many questions. How is he feeling? How is he doing? Is he okay? I think, he, and I know he doesn't want that. I think what's killing him probably inside is that he was doing well in that fight, right? I mean, he knocked yeah. his mouthpiece out. He won at least one of those first two rounds, if not both in, in, in some media's eyes. I know the judges didn't think so. So I, I do think that legacy will be kind to him and over time will recognize this guy was really damn good, you know, winning, he was undefeated as a heavyweight, at least as of right now, doing what he did at light heavyweight. Let me ask you guys quickly about that post-fight interview because, you know, Rogan was slammed for it and then he was forced to apologize for it. Um, and then this has brought up this discussion once again about fighters being interviewed afterwards, after a loss, concussed or not. H how do you feel about this, about the interview itself and then this general idea that fighters you know, should maybe not be interviewed after a loss of that nature. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. I understand where in that moment why Rogan did it. I think he just wanted to give Cormier the opportunity to have a say. Mm -hmm. I actually was more bothered by the one we saw, I don't know how many months ago, when, when, when uh, Overeem, uh, Overeem yeah. was claiming, oh, I heard, felt him tap, because, you know, yeah. here's a guy who's concussed and is claiming something that was absurd. And so you don't really know what's going what's gonna to sure. come out of the guy's mouth in that moment, because you know, it seemed like for a while Cormier didn't realize the fight was over. He thought that he wanted to keep going. Wanted to keep going. He could have said some things in that moment that would have made him seem like a sore loser or ridiculous. So I, I'm not a big fan of that kind of thing. I understand why Rogan wanted to give him a moment, but I, I just wish they would stick to it. To um, 
um, to, to not go in there. I just think that this is one of those cases where obviously this is the perfect um, perfect storm to think about this because Dana Cormier couldn't have been more clear how much this fight meant to him, right? So you watch him, especially when you see that view and you yeah. see him knocked out, um, disoriented, existential vertigo, trying to put it all back together. What happened to me? You know, who's what's going on? He doesn't know what's going on exactly, but then he's up there and all he knows at this moment as he's coming back to him is that he lost. And he's, you know what I mean? And that's what he's piecing together. And I felt like that's one of those, that's one of those situations where you see a guy like that and you, you can't help but feel the human side of the fight game. And yeah. there's a part of me that really loves that because we completely, all the time, match make, we do all these things without thinking about the human component. And we just, you know, you know right. they should be in these gunfights, they should just throw leather and all this stuff, but you don't think about it from a human side of things. To me, that's like the human moment. When a guy is like that and you see him, you know, and, and I know he was concussed, and you know, a lot of times I, there was the Luke Keekley thing, remember when he was crying when he was concussed and right. stuff like that. You don't know to what extent these things are, are altered, but you knew how much it meant to Daniel Cormier. I mean, he made no, there was no mistake how much this meant to him in his career. And to lose that fight and see him up there like that, it was hard, but it was also, I, I wouldn't have, I, I was good to see in that sense because it just, it humanized him, mm. you know. I, I, my only sense about this is, is that I don't know, it, you can produce beautiful moments. I don't think anyone would dispute this. And Todd Martin of Sure Dog actually wrote a great column saying on balance, these post fight interviews, even the ones who've been concussed, um, have on balance been quite good. It's only a handful that have been really yeah. bad. And yeah. I think that's true. The, the only problem I have with it, and apparently, did you see Rogan's podcast afterwards? I did not. So he said even Brian Stan reached out to him to thank him. For not, not, not for the apologizing, but for realizing that um, you shouldn't do this. He, apparently what Rogan said was that uh, Stan said when he was interviewed after the Vanderlei loss, he had no clue where yeah. he was. Um, so apparently there might be like a nascent or at least a quiet agreement that fighters don't like this. But my only thought is um, they, should, they should sell this ahead of time. Uh -huh. Either agree to the post-fight interview if you lose or agreed that your corner can save, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if you get finished, whether or not this is okay. Because I don't know how, if you've been concussed, you're in a position to consent. Your brain is right. scrambled. You don't, if you, if you don't know what's up and what just happened, asking you, are you okay with this, you're not, you're not in a position sure. to say you're okay. Settle that ahead of time, and I think it's probably a fine thing. Okay. Um, let me quickly ask you guys. I mean, we've talked about GSP Bisping ad nauseum, and we still have another, what, three <laughs> months to go, so Yay. we don't need to break it down. But, okay, so this is my question, and I'm happy you had that reaction. Is this salvageable? Because I look at the tweets from the UFC, and everyone's like, I don't want this, I don't want this. And let's be honest, this has been botched from the get-go. I mean, as recently as last week, telling people the ship has sailed, and now the ship is back. And I mean, you can't do this, you know? this is not something that you can do is it salvageable do you think come november 4th that people will be clamoring for it or have they just botched it and in hindsight should have pulled the plug on it let that shift well, part of what's going other people is just that it's not happened yeah it's just always off on the distance it's so far off in the distance you know people can't really take it for real anyway. it's all theoretical it's, but it's yeah. finally to the point if so, so is it happening at msg are we going to do this like so it's, if it's finally at this point where it's going to happen, at least you can circle it and be like, okay, let's get this thing over with, if nothing else. Right. But I don't know how much it's going to actually generate. You gotta get those guys back into their element where they're going to be going at another each other. Another presser? Well, I don't know about another <laughs> presser. We, maybe take the bottle away from uh, Bisping this yeah. time. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, I think that once they get rolling towards each other for real with a date and they're doing that, it may, it may be salvageable. I think it's going to generate excitement because you know, there is a belt in place. Is GSP's comeback? But I just don't think it's going to reach any kind of big crescendo like they're hoping. I, I, yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, I think by the time we get, if it's at MSG and yeah. it's the return of GSP, right. it would be like UFC 214, where you go in there, all you're thinking about is Mayweather McGregor, but hey, by Saturday, everyone sort of rolled around to it. I think it'll yeah. be fine. And frankly, at this point, you know, I was against it, and even now, I still don't like it. But we have this weird position where I don't know if Woodley's gonna be yeah. out, and even that then, helps it. Right, <laughs> right. Who's the contender? And at middleweight, you know, Whitaker's out. I don't really know who the contender is because you got Wyman winning, but off three losses. So, mm. so at the time when they first proposed it, I didn't like it because there was all these contenders, and now there's so no contenders. Yeah, so much has happened. Right. That's, That's why what's... it's always so hard to talk about right. the same. So, far so now right. you're just like, all right, whatever, fine. Yeah, yeah I think circumstances <laughs> have kind of at least made me come around on it because whatever. yeah, we got we got GSP <laughs> really should be should be contending for the welterweight belt if anything because it wasn't. There's not, you know, there's no real natural. This guy has to get the next title shot against Woodley guy. So GSP would have been a, a great, a great option, but Woodley's going to be out. Well, you know he's he was going to be botching the middleweight scene, but now he's not going to be botching the middleweight scene because all those guys are kind of you know. There's a lot of reasons why this fight shouldn't be happening, but a lot of those reasons that have sort of gone away. So there's no. I don't think there's a real 
intrinsic draw to this fight. But once these guys get together again and we hear Bisping open his mouth, and we see GSP, just hearing him being interviewed more, I think people get a little more excited about it. You know, the first thing we talked about today was, oh, it's so great to see a superstar back. They need yeah. superstars. Yep. And he, GSP he, is that guy. Yeah. And if this thing bombs, they only have themselves to blame because this should be a big deal. Right. And it kind of bothers me that it's not feeling like a big deal. But do, we know, it, do you have any idea when, when you think it'll be official? Any guess? I mean, it's it's all but I mean, it's all no, but no, signed. No no, 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 no. They did a press conference. Yeah, and they yeah, signed yeah. nothing. Yeah, but they didn't have a date. Now they have a date. <sighs> yeah. Now they I don't know. I think date. it's different. And though. by the way, let's just say, and I'm not you know sticking up for my fellow Montrealer, but he has always said like from the get go. Afterwards, he was like, hey, MSG, it'd be nice. To, like, look at that tweet when he was at MSG. It'd be nice to fight here. October when he tweeted. So they were the ones that rushed it. Let's not, like, I, I know maybe he shouldn't have come back when he did and agreed to the press conference. Mm -hmm. But why did you have to have that press conference the day <laughs> before the UFC the 209 That's the only problem, with no right? date attached to it? Yeah, that really boxed things up a little bit. Yeah. And then continuing to say the ship has sailed, while you know that there is a meeting coming up later on that day and that you know that GSP has explicitly said, I'm only coming back for one fight. Dana's you, new to the business. You need GSP more than... He's getting his feet wet. He would, he, he would make, never make it as an air traffic controller, would he? Imagine. Yeah. Okay, let me ask you guys about this before we go. So, we are what? Three weeks away from Mayweather-McGregor, right? Shoot me in the face, yes. <laughs> and, and there are reports now from ESPN.com and other outlets that ticket sales aren't going as they expected, that there's still a bunch of... Uh, aren't blocks. As many, there aren't as many suckers out there as they thought, huh? Okay, well, let me ask you about this, because um, one of the reports I read was that you can get a <laughs> row of six yeah. in 162 different places. So, so that was last week. I actually checked it yesterday. Okay, tell us. Uh, I don't know how many rows of six, okay. but rows of four, you can scroll page after page after page wow. of that. That's so, crazy. Here's where we are. And it's a lot different to ask someone to pay for a $100 pay-per-view as opposed to it is to the cheapest ticket at T-Mobile, I believe, is $3,500. Yeah. That's to be part of the problem. And <laughs> MMA fans aren't used to paying that. And what did I learn from the tour? This is an MMA fans kind of dream, right? Like they're loving this. The boxing fans are kind of like, oh, this is, yep. let's just get through this and get to Triple G Canelo. Did they misread the market? It, it could, See, here's the thing. Even if they don't sell any more tickets, the gate is still going to be astronomical because of how expensive. Yep. But did they misread it? Did they go a little too high? Can this be considered a flop? Is that possible? Flop, no. Okay. I don't see how it could be. I mean, if you're selling, remember the gate for uh, Mayweather Canelo was $20 million? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's easily going to pass that. And that that is like a ridiculous gate, you know? So, no, it's not going to be a flop. But um, I just feel like I, I don't think that this tempers the enthusiasm of the fight because here's my read on that. Um, and even some of the Irish journalists, Pizzi, Carol was tweeting about this. He said he doesn't know anyone from Ireland who's traveling over yeah, there. And they look at his mentions, and it's always like, dude, I can't afford it. Yeah. But, but... That doesn't mean they don't want to see the fight. So what my hunch is, is that, remember Brock Lesnar was always famous for, he couldn't really draw at the gate, but then he would do these huge pay-per-views. I think it'll be something like that. They're gonna have to find a way to fill the arena, and I'm sure by the 26th they will. But my guess is that the, I, the is it still open to um, possibility that it will pass me with a packet? I still would hold on to that, even if at the gate. And remember, at MGM Grand, it's less space, mm -hmm. and they give a ton of seats to the whales and the casinos. And so by the time it was open to the public, it went like that, and it was all venture capitalists. Where are the whales? Whales are guys who show up yeah. that the casinos just give everything they want to because they gamble uh, and they throw all the money back, right? Okay. They call them whales. Oh, okay. Um, well, you know, talking about fat people or something? I don't know. I don't know <laughs> who you're talking about. How many tickets are available? I yeah. Get, do we even know right. the range? Because it's a T-Mobile, right? Which sure. seats like a, a, 20, a capacity of like an NBA type 16 arena. or so. Okay. I mean, I was surprised when that report came out because if you remember when they first... You know, the, the fight was official. The hotel rooms skyrocketed. Yeah. Uh, and they were booking immediately and skyrocketed. So I felt like that. I didn't think that this would happen. It just felt like this was going to be a rich man's kind of pursuit. Anybody who's got money is going to be there, kind of like the the, the Frazier, Ali thing in MSG. All yeah. the stars come out. I still sort of think that that'll be the case as we right. get closer. Um, but that, honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm a little surprised. Even at that price, I think that you're probably right that, uh, you know, they, they were banking on probably the MMA side doing this, but the MMA side is just not used to seeing that kind of price tag, especially the Irish. Right. And we and we saw the Irish coming out after, you know, every single fight. Yep. And we, I remember when he was fighting Aldo, we, we started to talk about beforehand, we're like, do you think the Irish will show up in the same droves as they were before? And we're like, I don't know, because that's a lot of travel back more than they did. So I feel like you're kind of lopping out a side of his fan base and you're really only inviting, like you said, kind of the, the high rollers and everything. 
But I would be really, really surprised if there's any amount of tickets left as we get close, even at that price. I think this thing might fall short of Floyd's hopes and expectations, but I think McGregor's still going to have the biggest payday he's ever had. Sure. So, you know, I, I think for him it's going to be a success regardless. And for Mayweather, it'll still be a success, maybe not the kind of wild you know, um, bank robbery that he thought this was going to be. And, uh, but one thing that's going to, that would pump up, because, you know, we know Pauli Balanagi is in the gym with McGregor, and, um, you know, Pauli's not saying anything about what's going on because of saying whatever he's, he's well, saying he's saying things, but he's not giving us an indication <laughs> right, of right, what's right. going on. For enemies. And, but yeah. you know that they must be taping everything, and you know that all we need is McGregor to knock him down, you know, hurt him. And we're going to see the, the video of that coming out because you know the McGregor camp will. So that tells me that that he's that McGregor's not doing too much against Pauly because we would have been seeing clips I've of that. I've actually heard the opposite. And take it with a grain of salt, but uh, I, I, I continue to hear that he is exceeding everyone's expectations, including Pauly's, and that they are very, very surprised by how he's doing, pleasantly surprised. Now, you know, Jim talked. You don't think some of that stuff would have been uh, somehow crept onto the Internet that if no, all he had a show like, was? These are Conversation. Oh no, Paulie has to sign an NDA. Not, not so, Paul. Which like actually Connor. surprised. Well, I, I think that there's a mutual respect there. That if you have to sign an NDA, we're not going to leak footage of you getting knocked out. <laughs> um, I don't think he needs that to sell the fight. But just from talking to a lot of people who are there, everyone say, like I, I, I'm not hearing people saying like this is going to be an embarrassment. Mm. That's that's what the word is. At least as of right now. Do you feel, I feel the best thing for this fight is that it's happening in three weeks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like if this was happening in October, it, it, it would have fizzled. But the fact that it's happening soon and it's still kind of summertime and it's this little like thing that happened in two months, I think is, is the best thing for this fight. The, the, the sooner it happens, the better, yeah. basically. It's worth asking, I don't know if this is true, I'm merely, yeah. I'm merely asking. It's worth asking that if on the one hand, did the tour raise the vis visibility of this fight, of course, yeah. no doubt about it. On the other hand, did it crystallize some negative thoughts about it as well? Like, if you were kind of like, mm, I don't know about this one, and you saw the tour, you're like, ugh, I really don't like this. I, I saw a lot more criticism of the fight from, yes, the predictable cast of characters. Sure. But I saw it a lot more after that tour, and I wonder if that had an effect. I don't know. I'm just, I'm really questioning. Yeah. yeah. Uh, by the way, one last thing before we go. I have to ask you, because we kind of glossed over this, and, and, and you mentioned it. Um, let me put you on the spot. By this time next year, by this time next so year. August 3rd. Yes. Yep. Will John Jones have fought Brock Lesnar? Ooh, I'll say yeah, either yes or the fight have, will have been scheduled. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You feel that way, I, I, huh? or In another world, wow. I would have said no chance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. After Mayweather McGregor, is, yeah. you I think, be a I think 100%. No. 100%? Absolutely. I think it's 100% wow. because, I mean, first of all, they, call, they, they both are, go, you know, saying, going at each other, but also just the reaction to it. And we keep, so we were all in, is suspended along with him in terms of his move to heavyweight. So now he's also flirting with this move to heavyweight yeah, yeah. at some point. Yeah. And uh, to me, you just get, there's, there's all kinds of sweetness to that idea. And I think that at the end, when Brock Lesnar, who's Brock Lesnar going to fight? What, you know, what, he's going to come back. He's going to. This to me is like as big as it gets in terms of that. Oh, and I know my. it's kind of, I know it's kind of, it's it's another one of these weird circusy <laughs> events. But I'm like, to me, it's you know, it'll happen. Oh, yeah, yeah I'm especially under the new ownership. You know? I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, match Chuck's 100 percent and raise it another 100 percent. This is, it's definitely wow. either going to happen or, or Luke says Holy at smokes. least be scheduled. Why not? I mean, when when John <laughs> when John called out Brock on the fight night. I think I tweeted out something like, well, if he wants to, to go to heavyweight, he should, he should fight the champion, make it a super fight, fight Stipe, because that made more sense to me as a, because I'm into competition. But that's not really the money fight. The money fight is, is Brock Lesnar. And as, we all, you know, we, as we've all seen with this uh, Mayweather-McGregor thing, it's about many fights. And this would be a much more legitimate competition than Mayweather-McGregor is going to be. So this would be, this would be sure. something I'd want to see. Absolutely. Be a spectacle. Much more than I want to see this thing this month. Yeah. All right. You don't think so? I think it's, honestly, this is not a cop out. I think it's 50 50 at this point. Mm. I think there's obviously interest there. John wants to do it. I have no doubt that the UFC would do it. I think we have to see what happens with Brock's contract. Does he want to do the whole USADA thing all over again? I mm. certainly believe that it will be explored. To think that it's actually a done deal or anything of that nature is just inaccurate at this point. But I don't know. This is classic Brock Lesnar. He does yeah. this every time. Every time his contract is up with WWE, which it is up <laughs> in the uh, spring of 2018, he flirts with the UFC. He does this every time. Remember, Talk he showed up. He's a business man. He, he's the best. <laughs> I know. He showed up at UFC 184 when Ronda fought Kat Zingano. You remember he was standing there in the uh, in the front. He's wearing that like that uh, plaid jacket and everything. 
then he went back and, and, and re-signed with WWE. Remember he had that interview with Michelle Beadle and he said, I've retired from MMA. Mm -hmm. yep. And all of a sudden he comes back. He did this UFC 146. I saw him in the airport. He shows up, flirts with the idea, and then goes back. So this is classic Brock, but I do believe that he is a great businessman. I do believe they'll throw a lot of money his way. I do believe that John wants it. WME wants it, so who knows? I mean, and John's the, also said, John said, he specifically said, well, yeah, if I fight Stipe, that's a, you know, a challenge because Stipe is great stand-up and all this stuff. And he said the Lesnar fight, that's a winnable fight. He's, Jones has actually thrown the gauntlet out there. And, yeah. and I think that, you know, businessman, Lesnar, um, all that stuff, there's also a competitor inside him that doesn't like having someone say, "Sure, look at him and say, yeah, that's a beatable guy. He's got to do it for his country of Canada, man. Gotta that's do right. It. <laughs> Kudos to the Associated Press, who seems to have the only uh, line to Brock Lesnar's house up there in Saskatchewan, right? Every time something happens, Knocking on the door. Greg Beecham of the Associated Press gets a quote, which is kind of like talking to Sasquatch, because yeah. we heard like he doesn't have a phone or anything. It's just all bizarre. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. I think it's 50-50 at this point. Cop out. 11 fights in 11 weeks. That stretch for the UFC comes to an end this Saturday. How about that? Wow. You guys did Thank it. You've got to be happy because you've been to the West Coast like four times. Yes, last <laughs> and I'm going back next week for the uh, the open workout. So I will wow. not be with you guys next week, but I'll be replaced by Danny Segura. You'll sit in this chair, yep. and you'll be representing very well. No, poorly, Are we excited? But Are we excited for Mexico City? Uh, you know what? No one's talking about it. That Rashad Evans fight, man. Oh my God! Yeah. That is such we a could big do deal. Thirty minutes on that alone. Everyone talks about oh the sad decline of BJ Penn, and and I'm not writing Rashad off. Maybe he wins, but it's the Sam Alvey yeah. fight, and I always feel like let's yeah. let's put it in Mexico, and maybe no I one know. sees it. You know, and oh, it's bad. Man. We can you know I mean there's something to be said for that. I that's a it's a huge and the and the main event the main the event. Pettison, I like the that event. they geographically honed in on their guys. You know, with Brandon Moreno and, and sure. uh, Grasso. So to me, that's that's a smart way. But the Evans fight to me is very intriguing. I'm a little nervous for Evans. Yeah. You know, like just oh, yeah. like this I mean do or die, right? If you can't beat Sam Alvey, <laughs> with all due respect to Sam Alvey, I mean he is the bottom of that division. Where do you go? What uh, do you do? I don't know. And also remember when Mexico was gonna be the next Brazil? Yeah. Yeah, not so much. Yeah. <laughs> it happened. The ultimate fighter as well. I think they, you know, the, but, we didn't get to Dana White's right. Tuesday night contender series. You know what? We'll have plenty of time. You love that show. <laughs> I tell you what, did you see it on Tuesday? Respectfully, I did not. Wow, wow. I did not. Do it I know I would get to it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was, you it, love it. Uh, You're the biggest uh, fan. I'd like the, to see you sitting there next to Dana, Sean Shelby, and McMahon. A couple of other episodes <laughs> were not that great. The one on Tuesday was Loved it. phenomenal. Uh, wow. in, 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 in a word or two, why do you love it so much? It's, a, it's, it's, it's the ultimate fighter minus all the bullshit. Okay. <laughs> it's like wow. it's a streamlined version. You forget this, how good. You're selling me now. This, this is right you're up your alley. Okay, right. I'll, I'll very, very, very quickly. Sure. Uh, uh, the discoveries in terms of the broadcast. Paul Felder is amazing at broadcast at, at commentary. He? I did not know how good he was. Yeah. He's excellent. Number one. Number two, Laura Senko. You know, so you've done the sideline reporter thing. It's hard, and you've done a good job. She does a really good job. Yeah. So there's a broadcast there. I don't like that it's in the tough gym. It feels redundant. However. Why go through the Ultimate Fighter yeah. for all those weeks, and you have to win a tournament, and it guarantees if you win, you get the contract when you can just go and fight on the on the Dana White Tuesday Night Contender Series. Uh, and if you win, and you win in spectacular fashion, you really put it all out there, you have such a great chance. The guys fight hungry. The fights this past Tuesday were incredible. They were well matched. And the upset by Julian Marquez over Phil Hawes, incredible. Yeah. It was it's amazing. It's canned, right? So it's like, it's, it's not and canned. It's, and sure. it's like, yeah. you didn't mention Snoop. The Snoopcast is cool. Yeah. It's fine. Which do you choose to listen to? Uh, well, Felder's so good that, that, like, I like listening to him. I just go back and listen to the highlights. But my point is, if you want to get in, get out, get fights, and you're sure. done, <laughs> the Contender Series. I, I will incredible. say this. Sean O'Malley is a superstar in the making, right? Yeah. That guy who won Sugar mm -hmm. Sean with the Snoop and the smoking yeah. weed. I mean, he's got great charisma, and he's a great fighter. I, I saw his fight. And I will also say that I think that for the fighters, it's actually good. Like, I, I will admit, it's a little unsettling when they win and they're essentially begging Dana White to save them, give me some bread. And then there's that shot, which I think is completely inappropriate of them sitting in the, the locker room and just on pins and needles and like, you're the winner, fine. But if you're a fighter, it's actually a great opportunity because if you're fighting for LFA, you're making like one and one. If you're fighting for DWTNSCS, you're Ooh, making five and five. Just say contender series. You're, okay, I'm just trying to, you're making five and five yeah. for those fights. So yeah. it's actually, if you're not in the UFC, but trying to get to the yeah. UFC, and for the company, it's brilliant because it's like, okay, here's a way to get guys under our umbrella, but not fully commit to them, take them away from Bellator. 
it makes sense. And plus, on top of it all, from a business standpoint for Fight Pass, it's just more live events. And I hear, I hear so the streaming numbers people. are really good. Yeah so. yeah. so this is a good, and I think it ends end of August, at uh -huh. least this run. Uh -huh. All right, here you go. Luke Thomas, fan wow. of Tuesday Night Contender Tell Series. You, I want to see you there. Is it possible? <laughs> see you sitting there next to Dana and the guys telling them who they should sign? They know my number. <laughs> they can call me. <laughs> all right, we're out of time. Thank you so much for stopping by. So like I said, 11 fight cards in 11 weeks. That stretch for the UFC comes to an end this Saturday. They are in Mexico City. We're back next week. I will not be here. I'll be in Las Vegas covering the open workouts, but these fine gentlemen will be. So do not fear. But for now, we shall say goodbye and good afternoon and have a nice evening for Luke, Chuck, Jeff, I am Mario. Again, thanks so much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed our new mugs. With vodka. Woo! See you next time. Hey.